Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today who's involved in working and creating uh, a better tomorrow. Uh, we are headed north of the border mm-hmm. again today to, to our friends in Canada and have the honor today of being joined uh, by Dr. Lauren Matheson, who is a pro- portfolio portfolio manager uh, at the Center for Security Science, a part of Defense Research and Development Canada, which is a, a special operating agency of the Department of National Defense of Canada, whose purpose is to provide the Canadian Armed Forces, other government departments, and public safety and national security communities with both knowledge and technology uh, with a focus uh, in Dr. Matheson's uh, portfolio on chemical and biologic sciences, uh, where she develops and leads safety and security r and projects uh, with government partners, industry, and academia. Uh, Dr. Matheson previously served uh, as both the senior science advisor uh, within the office of the chief science operating officer and national manager uh, at Plant Health Research and Strategies at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Uh, And after 10 years of uh, consulting as a grants facilitator in clinical research, uh, she moved uh, to the public service uh, to pursue her interest in science policy and security science. Uh, Dr. Matheson holds a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Ottawa. She spent her uh, postdoc time at both uh, University of Saskatchewan working on uh, cell and molecular biology, uh, as well as at the uh, Royal University Hospital uh, in the Canadian Arthritis Network, focusing on pediatric rheumatology. Uh, And Dr. Matheson is a recent uh, 2022 a woman in defense and security emerging leader, uh, recognized for her exceptional work in improving the communications uh, within the Center for Security Sciences uh, as a defense scientist. We're honored to have with us today, uh, Dr. Lauren Matheson. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm excited to talk to you today. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of really interesting and converging themes here. Um, I would love to start off, you know, as we typically do, Lauren, by handing you the mic for a little bit, just to to talk a little bit more about you, if you could sort of take us back to the early days, uh, everything from a little bit of, you know, where you grew up, uh, when you developed sort of your, your first interest in STEM, and a little bit of your development of intellectual interest, both in biochem and cell and molecular biology. I think that'd be a great way to get things started. Sure. And that is, so at listening to you introduce me, it, uh, it, it was obvious about my winding path <laughs> to where I am now. Um, and I'm probably different from many of your guests on this show. Uh, I did not know from a young age that I was going to get involved in science. I, nice. I had no particular um, you know, aspiration to become a scientist early on. I was very interested in writing and journalism and the creative. I was into fine art and photography when I was when I was in high school. Um, my first sort of clue into the science world was when my guidance, my high school guidance counselor said, "You know, you're in this stream. You're on a path. You didn't take the prerequisites." Uh, to get into science in in undergrad. And I said, wait a minute, you're going to tell me I can't do something? (laughs) Um, I, so I said, you know what, I think I can do it. I I really want, I don't want to close any doors. I think I should uh, go and take that grade 11 biology and do the science because I don't want to close any doors. So I did that. And when I, once I was introduced to that and, uh, 
and, and those science uh, high school courses, I, I again was like, you know, I'm going to apply to all the programs in university and uh, and see where it leads me. And so sort of hap, hap, happenstance, I, I got a scholarship uh, to a biochemistry undergrad program in Ottawa. I grew up in Ottawa, uh, Ontario in Canada. And uh, so I, I just, I said, you know, I think I can do this. <laughs> I want to, I want to go down that road. So it, um, it took me on this very winding path. I, I, I got interested in my third year of, of undergrad. I got interested in lab work. Um, I did a summer, you know, in a lab and, uh, and I worked on freezing frogs of all things, nice. <laughs> looking at, uh, looking at how uh, up in, up in Canada, you know, we have certain animals that freeze solid in the winter and then come back to life in the spring. Um, and I, and it was fascinating to me, these questions. So I always had a curiosity of how things worked, but I didn't know until then that I really wanted to pursue science. So after being in this lab and doing my, my undergraduate work, um, in working on frogs that freeze, looking at proteins that help them do that in this cryogenic work. Um, I, I wasn't finished. I said, you know, I want to continue. I love school. I want I love to learn. Um, I'm going to continue. I want to go to grad school. So again, applying to various programs, not really sure. I did do a biochemistry, biotechnology um, double major in undergrad, um, applied to a biochem uh, graduate program started a master's, um, interviewed at a bunch of different labs because I had a scholarship. I thought, you know, I can, I could go anywhere. Um, and I ch ended up choosing a lab based on uh, not necessarily the topic, but the environment. And um, I've, I've actually given this advice to many uh, students that I've mentored over the years that it is a really, it's really, really important consideration when you're choosing um, grad school and, and, mm -hmm. a, and a lab to work in that the supervisor, advisor, um, the lab dynamic is almost as important as the interest you have in the topic that you're going to research. Um, it can make or break your whole experience and, uh, and choosing that advisor as someone who's going to support you um, in, in what you want to do is, is so important. And I was really, really lucky uh, that I had a great um, PhD supervisor. Um, my PhD was actually in looking at um, how immunology, our, our immune system and how it interacts with, uh, with biomaterials. Yep. So I worked, it was very interdisciplinary. I got to work with a great team of uh, chemical engineers out of University of Toronto who are developing uh, patents for particular um, materials used in drug delivery and also for implantable devices. And I was sort of the biochem arm looking at, um, you know, what, what does our immune system do with these, de with these devices when they're implanted? And, uh, you know, we, we discovered some really cool things and it's just solidified my love of new knowledge and, uh, and developing that whole research interest in, in um, you know, asking a question, what experimental design. Um, so I think that's what grad school does. It really helps you to, to um, just, define that, the, those questions, like figure out what questions you want to ask, how do you answer those questions, critical thinking, all of those mm -hmm. things. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that was my PhD. Oh. I, uh, I then went on to, um, from that very multidisciplinary PhD, um, did some biomedical engineering, developed some devices there. Um, I decided to go back to sort of my artsy uh, roots and I really loved microscopy. So I did some of that in, in my PhD, but I wanted to really focus in on live cell imaging and figure out, you know, the molecular aspects of these beautiful uh, images at the molecular level. Um, so I did a year of, of cell biology in Saskatchewan um, as a postdoc and uh, took some very cool videos, live cell videos, um, looking at the secretory pathway in mm -hmm. plant cells. And I worked with great people there who were very passionate about that particular niche um, <laughs> plant cell biology uh, area. And I knew I wasn't ultimately going to end up as, as um, an academic in that area, but I really enjoyed that experience of that intense, like I published 10 papers that year and I loved, I loved being involved in such a high energy lab. 
So that was a good experience. And then I decided to do something totally different again. I really wasn't sure um, where I wanted to end up. So I thought clinical research um, was something to look at, um, development of clinical trial, clinical trial work, um, mm -hmm. multi-center uh, work really fascinated me, how to, how to bring people together um, to work on, on a similar goal. Um, so I, again, with scholarship money, and I was fortunate throughout my whole uh, training to have good scholarships. Um, so it, once you have that, it gives you a lot of freedom, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're sought after. And it's, uh, it's very nice to be able to have the choice of, of where you go uh, for your next step when you come with your own money stipend money. So working with a team of clinicians, I was able to um, really dive into that clinical research world and, uh, and work with patients and clinicians and scientists uh, from all over. So it was, uh, it was great. So yeah, so this, that was my academic training winding path. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's it's a fascinating path. You know, I, I was spending some time, um, you know, swimming through uh, your publications in the in the peer-reviewed literature. And, and, you know, as you just mentioned, you know, you, we start off with, with macrophage function and morphology. <laughs> then we go to the, the, the Golgi bodies and endoplasmic reticulum and plants. And then we come back to something, you know, a really interesting place before we get to defense, and what you're doing in sort of the ag tech world, uh, where, where you spend some time, as you were mentioning in, 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 in terms of the clinical development, but you spend specific time in pediatric uh, mm -hmm. rheumatology, which I think is completely fascinating because obviously we think of uh, the autoimmune diseases as something that typically happens much later in life. Um, and obviously, in terms of runaway immune system, obviously, the last couple of years we've we, we've learned a lot about some of the uh, the cytokine responses to unknown microbes and so forth. Talk a little bit about your time in pediatric rheumatology because you you published some papers here, uh, not just on sort of the unexplained nature of it, but also uh, the ethics that go into you know if you have a clinical trial and you have you know kids with, yeah. with arthritis. Talk a little about your experience there and what you ran into. Absolutely. So. We having a background in immunology was helpful to yeah. to have a good understanding of where uh, of of just the you know I'm not medically trained but I could um, converse mm -hmm. with those clinicians um, on that topic yeah. and so getting involved that way it, it was useful to come from a background of, of immunology but my focus when I worked with that group was not necessarily on the science it was more as of uh, the function of um, bringing people together in a network. Yeah. And you'll see this as I, as we talk through the, the, my later years um, yeah. and, and the, and the things I've done more recently, uh, it's all been around networking. Mm -hmm. So networking nationally, uh, networking internationally and how um, important it is to work together. So they brought me on to coordinate this, this uh, multi-center, multi-million dollar research project that was longitudinal, was going to follow a bunch of patient, uh, uh, small children um, and their symptoms and their levels of activity and their biological um, indicators over many years. And so piecing all of those things together, but also laying the gr groundwork for um, what that, um, you know, we needed, we needed, we needed the other centers on board. So mm -hmm. I needed to go out, I needed to have this traveling roadshow of why you should participate and develop all of the, um, the resources that all of the different centers needed to, to buy into this project. And this was a great learning experience for me to um, really understand how those communication tools worked. And so it wasn't just about the science, it was about reaching the people that we needed to help us do this study. Um, and because pediatric rheumatology is such a small area, you know, there, um, yeah. Pediatric uh, childhood arthritis is not very common, right. and we only, we, you know, we have not very many centers in Canada. Um, obviously, in the U.S., it's much bigger. But we needed to work together in order to get that critical mass, critical number of of um, people enrolled in the study in order to make it make sense. And so that was my. Uh, part of my role was to really bring the people together um, mm -hmm. to, to really buy into the study. And 
uh, and lots of uh, good learning opportunities there to figure to figure that out, which served me well in subsequent um, endeavors. And so, uh, also in the in, in the creation of these communications materials, which I've become very passionate about science communications, making it accessible for people. Um, and, and so starting there, building that network uh, across Canada and then internationally, we called it UCAN, Understanding Childhood Arthritis mm -hmm. Network. Uh, it, was, uh, it was really, um, really a good experience for me to, to get involved with that group. Um, in terms of the research papers that I published when I was, when I was working with them, we did a, uh, we did a study um, comparing, you know, we, we wanted to draw blood and, and get some um, interesting inform clinical information from these young patients. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I really wanted to do was, you know, the blood draw thing, they're, they're poked and prodded all day long. What if we could get a finger prick drop? A droplet of blood and get what we needed from that. So we were doing some tests comparing, you know, if we wanted to look at vitamin D levels, for example, could we compare a capillary um, vitamin D level to a venous draw uh, vitamin D level and that kind of thing. So I did, I did do some comparison uh, work like that and we did publish it um, useful down the road to make a decision about, uh, you know, how we, how we do those studies. So that was my, my pediatric rheumatology. I, I did go on to, um, when we finished that work, I did go on in some of my consulting days to work with the same group. Um, I, I wrote, um, I helped write grants. Mm -hmm. I did, I helped write papers. Yeah. I developed um, some of their materials when they were publishing, um, you know, publishing their scientific work. I used to really enjoy uh, developing their figures. So translating complex material into mm -hmm. an infographic type of, um, so, so again, sort of this creative artsy um, interpretation of the science uh, of the science that we were doing. Um, and so I did that for, for quite a few years, uh, working with um, a number of clinicians who are just too busy to do the writing. You know, <laughs> lots of good ideas, but sure. they're, uh, they're busy in the clinic. So I remember the, those days of, you know, clinic, clinicians would work all day in the clinic and mm -hmm. then they, they wanted to talk to me at night. So as a scientist, I'm like, 11 p.m. We're going to meet and talk research. That's when they had time. So um, it was, uh, it, th those were fun days. But um, ultimately, I thought, you know, it worked really well for me. I had small children. So consulting was, was a really nice way. So spending time in, acad in an academic environment, um, but as a consultant was a nice way for me to bridge uh, between my, my purely academic background and then making the decision to jump to the public service. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, at, at that point in the jump, you uh, you get involved um, as, you know, at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, looking mm -hmm. at plant health uh, research and different strategies. And again, you, you continue to publish on sort of the complex dynamics that are going on in plants in terms of the, the signaling pathways and, and so forth. And I, mean, I guess a lot of what happens in plants to, to keep them healthy and, and protected in their own right. Um, and then, you know, speaking about this theme that you just mentioned in terms of putting together the right people in a network, Mm -hmm. Come 2020, uh, you published this fascinating paper uh, entitled Science Diplomacy for Plant Health. Uh, and, and I think you, you published this paper with, I think, every plant protection organization on the planet. Because yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of authors in this one. But, but sort of the general message, just like we think about uh, and we've been thinking about human health and, and, and science diplomacy uh, in the COVID age and so forth. Uh, here we have something, again, these bugs, whether they're bugs or micros, whatever that infect plants and destroy them um, don't respect borders. <laughs> and, and we have to keep this in mind too, because without the plants, you know, we don't eat uh, yeah, and so forth. And you know the whole story there. Talk a little bit about this, this research collaboration and, and what you were specifically focusing here in terms of uh, how much this damage uh, when it comes to these critical species can affect, you know, not just human health, but the, the economies. Um, and then I just, you know, thinking back, just as a side note, I, um, I I had a little period of my own career in ag tech, and I was always fascinated by the uh, the numbers beyond not what was going on in the field, but uh, post-harvest. Uh, someone showed show me the numbers you know, between what happened and how much we lose on the trucks and the trains and everything of getting things from farms just to the markets. 
talk a little bit about that one as well, because I, I think that's a, something we don't really think about as much, uh, where we, we lose a lot of sort of nutrition and, and calories along the way. Yeah. So yeah, you so you said a lot there. So we um, plot health. Plot health is underrated. Okay. <laughs> I think you know I the top of the food chain is human health. Everybody cares about that as we should. Um, but it, the 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 actual fact is that human health is impacted by animal health, and it's impacted by plant health, and it's impacted by the environment. So we have to care about all of these things, um, you know, in a one health concept. Yep. So working for the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, um, you know, up in Canada, it's, it's the government uh, bought regulatory body that looks after all of animal health plant health and food safety. And so we've got a separate public health agency of Canada that deals solely for, and we've also got Health Canada. So we've got uh, a se separate agencies that deal solely with, with human health factors. Mm -hmm. um, but CFIA, as we call it, um, is responsible for those three, you know, food safety, plant health and animal health. And being at that agency was very eye-opening for me. Um, you know, getting involved in science advice, and thinking through how all of these all of these things are intertwined every day, um, including the economy. So, as a regular as a regulatory body, we're we're responsible for um, you know the regulations around what people can do and can't do, imports and exports, mm -hmm. and that absolutely has a plays into into our economy um, and our farmers and and. Um, you know, what are they, what are they allowed? Like, what are we testing for? What, what can we, what are other countries expecting from us in our, in, in our exports um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, diagnostic testing uh, and certifications before we can export. So um, my time in plant health at CFIA, I, uh, I was responsible for the, um, the, national research program um, and sort of strategic uh, vision for how we were uh, how, how we were moving forward. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you know, that research cycle, you come up with what are the problems that we need to address? Um, we, have a, we have a team of scientists at, uh, at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency that work focus on plant health. They're a very small number of, of those people. Mm -hmm. There's a very large number of problems. Okay. So we just didn't have the capacity to answer every question we had. Um, and that's not unique uh, to plant health. That's everybody everywhere. We can't know everything about everything. What we do need to know is who to call, um, who, who knows what, and who to, call, who to call when we need to have an answer to a particular question. So that's where network these networks come in. Um, and uh, and you referred to that paper on uh, science diplomacy mm -hmm. in plant health. I want to I want to uh, put a disclaimer out that I was just a co-author. <laughs> um, yeah. Many many people contributed to that paper, as you mentioned. Every plant protection agency in the world, it seems. Yeah. Eufresco was the network that that you're um, that that paper refers uh -huh. to in building that plant health um, global community of plant protection. Uh, and I have totally bought into this, um, gl these global network, uh, the importance of the global network of people um, who, who work have a common, uh, common interest in, mm -hmm. in whatever it is they're working on. So as someone who was responsible for our Canadian um, plant health research program and making a decision, we had a small pot of money, we have a small number of scientists, we have a large number of problems. <laughs> um, how do we how do we coordinate uh, with other people um, and figure out how we can collaborate and share information? We're going to pick we're going to pick this problem to work on and, and devote our resources here. You guys pick that problem to work on and devote your resources, and we're going to share that information. Or we're going to collaborate because we have a particular expertise that's complement complementary to yours, and we're going to work on the same issue. So we that network is really a place that uh, you know they have a repository of both challenges that are facing the plant health uh, world, as well as, you know, a repository of projects that are ongoing in the various um, member countries. And then there's a place where we can um, share that information. Mm -hmm. And finding those platforms to 
uh, build those relationships is really, really important. So this science diplomacy, global science diplomacy is, is absolutely a place where we can come together and, uh, and build those relationships and to, to enable sharing of information. Yeah, that's, that's such that's such a, an important message. Not as you were just saying, not just for human health, but uh, for the plant health as well. So I, 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 I really I, I enjoyed that paper, and I give you all the credit, even though, yeah. <laughs> yeah. as as one of many authors. But no, it, it's, it's a very important message there, in in, in, in that respect. Um, so you move now from uh, plant health. Uh, to the the Center for Security Sciences, and and you know we did this recent a couple a couple months ago. Um, Eric Fournier uh, was mm -hmm. on the show talking about innovation and, and the ideas group. Talk a little bit about obviously you know your focus here is on chemical and biologic sciences. Talk just a little bit about what it means to manage a portfolio in the context of what you're doing at, at the center, obviously nothing confidential, but anything you yeah. talk about. And then, you know, as I mentioned, you know, sort of the, you know, this uh, acknowledgement that you got in terms of uh, women in defense and security, uh, you know, you're very well known and you know, people write a lot about you in terms of you know, not just the research you do, Lauren, but you're very good at communicating. It's, you know, obviously you're extremely well at communicating on this show, but you're very good at getting the word out there about science not just to the national partners, the international partners. You're involved in setting up these symposia uh, to, to educate others. Talk a little bit of that part of the role as well. Sure, thanks for, for all of that, actually. We, um, maybe I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of how I became interested in this bio, biosecurity space because it didn't Please. stem from the, my plant my plant world. Okay. Um, I, it I actually so. <laughs> took me a step back uh, when I first joined the Canadian Food, Food Inspection Agency um, because I they brought me in um, as a as a senior science advisor, which was an incredible role to join the public service uh, mm -hmm. in because I was placed in the office of the chief science operating officer. And without having uh, intimate knowledge of how government works um, and having a very outsider perspective, I was able to contribute in a way I think that was very different from other people. Um, but it did, get, it did allow me this bird's eye view of the organization. Okay. And it was, it, it was a really interesting perspective, but also, um, you know, right away, sort of day one, I show up and, and Day one of, of being a government employee, they said, uh, write, a, write a proposal for to create a network. This is what you do. You, you bring people together and you write grants. You can do this. So off I go to write a proposal to the Canadian Safety and Security Program, which mm -hmm. leads into what I do now. But I wrote a proposal for, to them to, um, to seek funding for um, bringing together uh, a group of um, laboratory, government run laboratories in the high containment uh, space. So uh -huh. biosafety level four zoonotic laboratory network is what Got we it. create. And that was five countries coming together, government run labs from five countries coming together, both public health and animal health labs who work on the, you know, the, the worst uh, of the worst viruses. So um, level four, Level four viruses include sort of Ebola, Marburg, um, Lassa, Nipah, those kinds of, of viruses. So, mm -hmm. so looking at, and again, like these labs are few and far between. They're only, you know, I think there's maybe 60, mid 60s in mm -hmm. the world. We yep. only have two in Canada. They're co-located in Winnipeg. Um, so these high contaminant labs are, are often working in isolation and they're, and they're government run. So the scientists often feel fairly isolated, um, in terms of, you know, they don't have a lot of a way, they don't have mechanisms to share information. So we created this network, uh, we got funding through, through, uh, DRDC, so Defense Research and Development Canada, uh, the Canadian Safety and Security Program gave us some money. We were able to um, fund some uh, bench work out of Winnipeg to, to do some diagnostics, but also to create this network and really foster those relationships. And this was pre-pandemic. So, um, and I ran the secretariat for that network for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and it was it was uh, amazing to see just fostering those relationships, bringing people together on a regular basis to have informal conversation, um, talking about how they set up their lab, talking about how they design their experiments, talking about how they deal with their animals, like all of these things are just, um, 
they, they were really excited about being able to come together and in a way that we, we did it virtually. Um, we met virtually mul multiple times a month and people really bought into this concept of, um, of sharing information this way. Mm -hmm. So starting there, so I did that and then I moved on to this plant health role um, in, in terms of what we just talked about sure. uh, for a little bit. And then I, I thought, you know, I, I, I loved that work going back to the, to the to biosafety level four um, work from that network. And that network is still ongoing and functional and, and did a lot of good work during, during, during the COVID-19 pandemic um, in terms of information sharing. And I thought, you know, there's an opportunity at Defense uh, Department of National Defense in, in Canada, and, and I, should, uh, I should check it out. <laughs> so um, that program, that Canadian Safety and Security program, is where I now work. I've been there for about a year and a half, so it hasn't been that long. Uh, but I am very familiar with the program, given that I worked in that space. I wrote proposals. I supported scientists who held that funding while I was at CFIA. So being intimately... Um, you know, just just involved with that program while I was at CFIA. Uh, so I had knowledge of the program before I joined DRDC. Uh, they brought me in as a, um, uh, you know, in chemistry and biology portfolio manager, which means that I... Um, I'm responsible, so the, the Center for Security Science runs this program, similar to the IDEAS program okay. that you talked to Eric Fournier about um, on a past show. It has a pot of money that is destined to um, fund research mm -hmm. uh, on challenges that we put out. Um, so we develop, over time, we develop challenges in various areas and put them out as, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for, we, we have a call for proposals uh, to really targeted at government scientists. And this money is Canadian money, so it needs to stay in Canada. Uh, we can partner with, with international people, but um, it's targeted to our government scientists, both, well, federal, provincial, municipal levels, um, all government, all levels of government. Um, to put to put in proposals uh, against the challenges that we put out and uh, and get some funding to work specifically on a on a challenge that sort of falls at the intersection of mandates. Mm -hmm. So we don't fund work that's only that's your responsibility in terms of if it, if it was uh, it falls to another government department. Um, we wouldn't fund that, but if it's something that's sort of a gray area, you know, it could be it could be public health, it could be animal health, something that falls at that intersection, mm -hmm. we we would um, target as something that we we would want to fund. And um, so I've I, I direct projects that are funded through our program, and work with our government scientists to uh, to both. You know, they do the bench work now. I'm not in the lab anymore, but okay. um, I, I really enjoy working closely with uh, with many different government agencies to solve problems that are affecting everybody. And also internationally, you know, we have our we do we still maintain our international partnerships. And again, it's about this uh, network of people building those relationships. So we know who to call when there's a problem. Very cool. Very cool. Well, you mentioned earlier, you, you got me thinking, um, you know, as you were mentioning sort of the, the biosafety level four, and then you, you mentioned One Health uh, earlier in the show. And, you know, we profiled some of these different stories uh, on, on previous shows, uh, things like uh, Hendra uh, down in, in Australia and sort of the, the bat horse human connection and spent a little time in, in Africa talking about Ebola and chimpanzees. Um, any interesting One Health uh stories that we should know about per canada mm -hmm. i mean I don't, I don't know if there's canada if, if the if the moose has a, you know any connection to i mean just anything interesting yeah. that we should just know about uh, fun facts yes. in terms of one health per north of the border sure um you know i get an exciting project that we're working on right now actually and it's published i can talk about it cool um we have uh you know and it's sars cov2 related so we have a, a group of scientists that we fund to look at uh we decided to go down this road of wildlife surveillance mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. is not something that is traditionally um exploited 
as much as it should be. We, yeah. we don't look, we don't go looking for disease in wildlife. <laughs> they it. present to us and then we have to figure it out, but normally we don't survey for uh, disease. So we, we do know though that uh, many different species are potentially impacted by COVID just like mm -hmm. humans. Yeah. And we had this worry that, you know, we're gonna, animals are gonna get COVID just like humans yeah. and it's gonna circulate amongst that population, potentially change, become a new variant of concern. And the, the real concern was having those animals pass it back. As, as something potentially yep. worse to humans. There's, you know, spill over and then there's spill back um, as we call it. So we started down this road of looking at white-tailed deer. Mm. Um, they're everywhere <laughs> in, uh, you know, in, in Northern the US and, and, in our, in, and in Canada, they're cool. everywhere. So we, uh, we found that there's high prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 in white-tailed deer and that looking at um, looking at over time we you know we looked at those since since the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 uh, we found that this uh, this jumped into that population of animals um, from humans and has circulated amongst the population of deer for you know a year and wow. until we found it again and it's become very genetic genetically diverse so we found a, a brand essentially a brand new variant many um many you know i think it's 65 or 70 mutations um that now that particular variant is circulating amongst the population of deer so hmm. it's basically become a deer virus right. now. And we did find that we wanted to look to see in, in our human population what's going on. Um, has this, so we did find amongst um, hunters, there has been ca a case of spillback from deer to human of this particular variant. We don't right. know what it means yet um, and clinically, but uh, this, this was just published as the very first example of a uh, very genetically diverse uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, virus that has jumped from, that has circulated in an animal population and come back and infected humans. Mm. Um, there's also been evidence of this in mink, um, right. but this, this, this was the first time in Canada that we really, so this was a, this was a big deal finding, finding this out. Um, and the group of scientists who, who've been following this are continuing to work on it, but it's, it's through a project uh, funded from uh, out of my, my own portfolio, um, funded through the Canadian Safety and Security Program, and it is something that we're, we're following closely, uh, but very interesting scientifically, and, uh, and we don't know necessarily what it means in terms of clinical representation of COVID, uh, but it is, is an interesting interesting thing and to get some messaging out to our hunter you know our hunting population perhaps some awareness around the fact that these deer that they're hunting could potentially be carrying something that they don't want to get yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's a, it's a extremely important message and i think it speaks to the uh the importance as you were saying you know we, we don't have time or the resources to shotgun sort of screen everything out there but sort of this targeted biosurveillance uh in these cases and studying what they mean is is so very important so no, no that's that's a that's a wonderful example i very fascinating to hear about that um along those lines lauren you know thinking about um sort of the, the next generation that, you know, we hope is listening to the show and, you know, uh, looking at, you know, the uh, studying biochemistry and molecular biology and so forth. Um, how do we encourage um, more Dr. Lauren Matheson's to 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 go about the, this type of work? I mean, we, we always have this conundrum, especially, you know, I spend a lot of time at sort of the intersection of national security, innovation, and I always ask our guests, you know, we, we, we want to create these these next generation folks like the Lauren Mathesons of the world, but we we want them to focus on this type of work. We don't we don't want them to go off to this pharma company or this, you know, tech right. company, Silicon Valley. We we have these issues and we gotta be at the bleeding edge to to go after them. Message for the next generation that's coming. Not that you, mean, you look like you're all 20 years old, but uh, oh. for the next generation that's coming <laughs> after, uh, to, to put them on this path and, and excite them about uh, this particular sector. 
Yeah, I think that uh, when I joined the public service, it, and I had other opportunities, you know, I could have gone down that industry road, but I, I think that it, it just, it spoke to me as something that could become more impactful. If mm -hmm. you want to, um, if you want to elicit change in the world, it, the best place to do it is through policy. And is yeah. policy interesting? To lots of people it is. But that science policy interface is amazing because you can act, you can do a lot um, as a scientist in in that space. So being able to speak to decision makers and communicate your message is one of the most important important things. Um, so I, I I really was excited about joining the public service um, and that role of science advice is a really great way to get to know how policymakers think and understand what they need to know in order to make the decision. They mm -hmm. don't need to know all the scientific technical detail. They need you to distill it into a succinct message so that they can understand how to make that decision with all the other considerations that they need to, can, you know, to take into account. But um, in order to get people interested in that, just being able, you know, when and when you're when you're a kid, you think of, you know, what can I do? I can be a lawyer, or a doctor, or uh, an accountant. I don't know. You can, you've got, you you feel almost like there's these various. There there aren't very many streams. I think mm. that mm, trying to trying to communicate to that younger generation that there's you don't need to take you don't need to pick a path and stay on it forever. There's right. lots of different ways to contribute, and the public services is a very um, meaningful way to provide value to society. So, you know, you're not going to get rich, <laughs> but you, you, you know, every day I think I, I can, I made a contribution and I can feel good about yep. making a contribution. And so that, that to me is meaningful. And, um, and I really enjoy the work in that public sector. Um, it, it took me away from being a very specific, you know, I was, I came out of a very niche, like during my PhD, you're so hyper-focused on one thing or during your postdoc, mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're working on one protein in one, um, in one cell and one, like there, mm -hmm. it's very, very uh, niche being able to um, think, uh, think a little bit bigger and broader and how things impact um, on a societal level, I think the public service is great. So, um, you know, I highly recommend people consider that as, as a career option. And there's lots of science focused jobs in the public service, lots mm -hmm. outside of just lab work. There's lots of lab, uh, lab um, science scientists roles, but there's also science advice roles, science yep. policy um, advice. And then, and then also, um, you know, now I'm a defense scientist. Um, it, my classification is a, as a defense scientist, but I also, I don't do lab work. I coordinate, I mm -hmm. think I get to, you know, I have time to think about the challenges that face us. And, and that's, um, it's, it's also got got its merits to, to have time to, to think through the problems and then find where, where, where we next need to innovate. Got it. Got it. Yeah. What, um, while we have you, Lauren, what, uh, what else is coming up? Because I know, you know, you've been involved in the, uh, you know, the, the, the virtual symposium series recently. Mm -hmm. um, any, uh, getting any, any other conferences coming up, talks, places that we can hear you, maybe meet you at some point, anything else that I missed or that you might want to mention, please take the floor. Sure. Um, you know, I haven't done a lot of, since the pandemic, I haven't done a lot of traveling to, to meetings. There's lots of virtual places. Um, you know, the Canadian Science Policy Conference just ended. That's a great place to meet a lot of, um, to network. Mm -hmm. And I do, you know, I can, I can leave yeah, your listeners with some, maybe, maybe some, I don't know if I want to call it advice or, sure, um, you know, take home message about, about what I have gleaned as important, um, you know, my humble opinion, um, that networking, you know, saying yes, like just 
don't eat, don't worry if you don't feel qualified or that you're not you may not be the right person if you're presented with an opportunity to meet people engage um, get get it just be curious and, and be interested in uh, that these people in this topic might have something to offer that yep. um, it's really it, it was a really valuable thing for me just to you know I took a winding path and I was interested in a lot of different things but uh, you know they served they served me well over the years that uh, and I never really worried about the next step you know I thought it would always present itself and it has so it's it's not you, know, you don't have to lay out your entire life's path ahead of time and and, and worry about it um, so so just be curious is the biggest uh, the biggest advice that I have to people going into into science: just uh, become involved, do what you do as much as you can, and, and meet as many people as you can. That networking piece is is important. Meeting people, um, you know, don't underestimate the value of small talk in, in getting to know somebody. Yep. <laughs> um, it always starts that way, and and it's uh, it's an important part of relationship building. And I think that uh, building relationships during times of peace, um, you know, before a crisis happens is really important. So I've always promoted that, that, that in these networks that I've been involved in, um, we take the time to really get to know each other uh, before we have a crisis, you know, in advance of, of an issue so that when an issue presents, we can, that, that trust is there. And that's on a personal, you know, that can happen on an individual level, on an organizational level, bilaterally between countries, and then at a multilateral level as well. And I've worked in all of those different levels and it's, uh, it, th that carries through all of it. So, um, but you mentioned the symposia that, uh, that we organize. And I think that that's one of the things that I, I brought to the Center for Security Science at DRDC. Um, it was lacking when I joined that that we didn't have a we didn't have a forum to communicate accessibly communicate the science that we're doing with our partners uh, to both actually internally. Uh, to DRDC, as well as externally to our other partners and other people who might have an interest in the topic. So, um, and I, I've been working, I've been working on these, you know, we have maybe two, between 200 and 300 people uh, attend some mm -hmm. of these events and, um, and and they're virtual and and it, it's reaching a lot more people than they used to be when they were mm -hmm. held in person. So uh, so it's nice to, I host those. So they happen on a quarterly basis right now. Um, and we're looking at, uh, we're looking at opening up some other seminar, different seminar series to showcase some of, some of our work. But um, yeah, so the, that's the, some of the science communication stuff that I've been, I've been doing in the Center for Security Science. Outstanding. Really outstanding work, and it's um, no, it's 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 fa it's a fascinating journey you've been on. I'm 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 glad you're there doing it, and uh, and continuing to you know, as you say, not just advance the science, but the the all important sort of science communications to uh, yeah. to enlighten everyone out there uh, to, to where we are and where we need to go with with some of this work. So really, uh, really great uh, story, Lauren. Um, for again, for everybody that. Uh, is going to be listening to this particular episode of the show across the various podcast networks or watching on our YouTube channel. Again, you've been listening to Dr. Lauren Matheson, Portfolio Manager, Center for Security Sciences of Defense Research and Development Canada, part of the Department of National Defense. Uh, Lauren, again, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your quite busy schedule to come talk to us for a little while about all these issues. Obviously, thank you for everything you're doing there. And as we like to say on our show, um, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow via the, the work and the communications that you do. Really very impressive story. Okay. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun. <laughs>